Volume One, Letters Thirteen through Eighteen of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brooke. Letters Thirteen through Eighteen, read by Capricia Page as Emily Montague. Kit Nusis, as Edward Rivers. Amanda Friday, as Arabella Fermor. Letter 13. To Miss Fermor at Saliri, Montreal, September 2nd. My dearest Belle will better imagine than I can describe the pleasure it gave me to hear of her being in Canada. I am impatient to see her, but as Mrs. Melmoth comes in a fortnight to Quebec, I know she will excuse my waiting to come with her. My visit, however, is to Saliri. I long to see my dear girl, to tell her a thousand little trifles interesting only to friendship. You congratulate me, my dear, on the pleasing prospect I have before me, on my approaching marriage with a man young, rich, lovely, enamoured, and of an amiable character. Yes, my dear, I am obliged to my uncle for his choice. Sir George is all you have heard, and without doubt loves me, as he marries me with such an inferiority of fortune. I am very happy, certainly. How is it possible I should be otherwise? I could indeed wish my tenderness for him more lively, but perhaps my wishes are romantic. I prefer him to all his sex, but wish my preference was of a less languid nature. There is something in it more like friendship than love. I see him with pleasure, but I part from him without regret. Yet he deserves my affection, and I can have no objection to him which is not founded in caprice. You say true. Colonel Rivers is very amiable. He passed six weeks with us, yet we found his conversation always new. He is the man on earth of whom one would wish to make a friend. I think I could already trust him with every sentiment of my soul. I have even more confidence in him than in Sir George, whom I love. His manner is soft, attentive, insinuating, and particularly adapted to please women. Without designs, without pretensions, he steals upon you in the character of a friend, because there is not the least appearance of his ever being a lover. He seems to take such an interest in your happiness— as he gives you a right to know your every thought. Don't you think, my dear, these kind of men are dangerous? Take care of yourself, my dear Belle. As to me, I am secure in my situation. Sir George is to have the pleasure of delivering this to you, and comes again in a few days. Love him for my sake, though he deserves it for his own. I assure you, he is extremely worthy. Adieu, my dear. Your most affectionate, Emily Montague. Letter 14. To John Temple, Esquire, Pall Mall, Quebec, September 15th. Believe me, Jack, you are wrong. This vagrant taste is unnatural and does not lead to happiness. Your eager pursuit of pleasure defeats itself. Love gives no true delight but where the heart is attached, and you do not give yours time to fix. Such is our unhappy frailty that the tenderest passion may wear out and another succeed, for the love of change merely as change is not in nature. Where it is a real taste, tis a depraved one. Boys are inconstant from vanity and affectation, old men from decay of passion. But men, and particularly men of sense, find their happiness only in that lively attachment of which it is impossible for more than one to be the object. Love is an intellectual pleasure, and even the senses will be weakly affected where the heart is silent. You will find this truth confirmed even within the walls of the seraglio. Amidst this crowd of rival beauties eager to please, one happy fair generally reigns in the heart of the sultan. The rest serve only to gratify his pride and ostentation, and are regarded by him with the same indifference as the furniture of his superb palace, of which they may be said to make a part. With your estate you should marry. I have as many objections to the state as you can have, I mean, on the footing marriage is at present. But of this I am certain that two persons at once delicate and sensible, united by friendship, by taste, by a conformity of sentiment, 
by that lively, ardent, tender inclination which alone deserves the name of love, will find happiness in marriage, which is in vain sought in any other kind of attachment. You are so happy as to have the power of choosing. You are rich and have not the temptation to a mercenary engagement. Look round you for a companion, a confidant, a tender, amiable friend with all the charms of a mistress. Above all, be certain of her affection, that you engage, that you fill her whole soul. Find such a woman, my dear Temple, and you cannot make too much haste to be happy. I have a thousand things to say to you, but am setting off immediately with Sir George Clayton to meet the Lieutenant Governor at Montreal a piece of respect which I should pay with the most lively pleasure, if it did not give me the opportunity of seeing the woman in the world I most admire. I am not, however, going to set you the example of marrying. I am not so happy. She is engaged to the gentleman who goes up with me. Adieu. Yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 15. To Miss Montague, at Montreal. Sillery, September 16. Take care, my dear Emily, you do not fall into the common error of sensible and delicate minds, that of refining away your happiness. Sir George is handsome as an Adonis. You allow him to be of an amiable character. He is rich, young, well-born, and loves you. You will have fine clothes, fine jewels, a fine house, a coach and six, all the douceur of marriage, with an extreme pretty fellow, who is fond of you, whom you see with pleasure and prefer to all his sex and yet you are discontented, because you have not for him at twenty-four the romantic passion of fifteen, or rather that ideal passion which perhaps never existed but in imagination. To be happy in this world it is necessary not to raise one's ideas too high. If I loved a man of Sir George's fortune, half as well by your own account you love him, I should not hesitate one moment about marrying, but sit down contented with ease, affluence, and an agreeable man— without expecting to find life what it certainly is not, a state of continual rapture. "'Tis, I am afraid, my dear, your misfortune to have too much sensibility to be happy. I could moralise exceedingly well this morning, on the vanity of human wishes and expectations, and the folly of hoping for felicity in this vile sublunary world. But the subject is a little exhausted, and I have a passion for being original. I think all the moral writers, who have set off with promising to show us the road to happiness, have obligingly ended with telling us there is no such thing, a conclusion extremely consoling, and which, if they had drawn before they set pen to paper, would have saved both themselves and their readers an infinity of trouble. This fancy of hunting for what one knows is not to be found is really an ingenious way of amusing both oneself and the world. I wish people would either write to some purpose, or be so good as not to write at all. I believe I shall set about writing a system of ethics myself, which shall be short, clear, and comprehensive, nearer the Epicurean, perhaps, than the Stoic, but rural, refined, and sentimental. Rural, by all means, for who does not know that virtue is a country gentlewoman? All the good mammas will tell you, there is no such being to be heard of in town. I shall certainly be glad to see you, my dear, though I foresee strange revolutions in the state of Denmark from this event. At present I have all the men to myself, and you must know I have a prodigious aversion to divided empire." However, tis some comfort they all know you are going to be married. You may come, Emily. Only be so obliging to bring Sir George along with you. In your present situation you are not so very formidable. The men here, as I said before, are all dying for me. There are many handsomer women, but I flatter them, and the dear creatures cannot resist it. I am a very good girl to women, but naturally artful, if you will allow the expression, to the other sex. I can blush, look down, stifle a sigh flutter my fan, and seem so agreeably confused. You have no notion, my dear, what fools men are. If you had not got the start of me, I would have had your little white-haired baronet in a week. Yet I don't take him to be made of very combustible materials, rather mild, composed, and pretty, I believe. But he has vanity, which is quite enough for my purpose. Either your love or Colonel Rivers will have the honour to deliver this letter. It is rather cruel to take them both from us at once. However, we shall soon be made amends, for we shall have a torrent of bows with the general. Don't you think the sun in this country vastly more cheering than in England? I am charmed with the sun, to say nothing of the moon, though to be sure I never saw a moonlight night that deserved the name till I came to America. Mon cher Père desires a thousand compliments. You know he has been in love with you ever since you were seven years old. 
He is vastly better for his voyage, and the clear air of Canada, and looks ten years younger than before he set out. As you, I am going to ramble in the woods, and pick berries, with a little smiling civil captain, who is enamoured of me, a pretty rural amusement for lovers. Good morrow, my dear Emily. Yours, A. Furmore. Letter 16. To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, September 18. Your brother, my dear, is gone to Montreal with Sir George Clayton, of whom I suppose you have heard, and who is going to marry a friend of mine, to pay a visit to Monsieur Le General, who has arrived there. The men in Canada, the English, I mean, are eternally changing place, even when they have not so pleasing a call. Travelling is cheap and amusing, the prospects lovely, the weather inviting, and there are no very lively pleasures at present to attach them either to Quebec or Montreal, so that they divide themselves between both. This fancy of the men, which is extremely the mode, makes an agreeable circulation of inamoratos, which serves to vary the amusement of the ladies, so that upon the whole tis a pretty fashion, and deserves encouragement. You expect too much of your brother, my dear. The summer is charming here, but with no such very striking difference from that of England, as to give room to say a vast deal on the subject, though I believe, if you were pleased to compare our letters, you will find, putting us together, we cut a pretty figure in the descriptive way— at least if your brother tells me truth. You may expect a very well-painted frost-piece from me in the winter. As to the present season, it is just like any fine autumn in England. I may add that the beauty of the nights is much beyond my power of description, a constant aurora borealis, without a cloud in the heavens, and a moon so resplendent that you may see to read the smallest print by its light. One has nothing to wish but that it was full moon every night. Our evening walks are delicious, especially at Sillery, where it is the pleasantest thing in the world to listen to soft nonsense, whilst the moon dances through the trembling leaves. A line I stole from Philander and Sylvia. But to return, the French ladies never walk but at night, which shows their good taste, and then only within the walls of Quebec, which does not. They saunter slowly, after supper, on a particular battery, which is a kind of little mall. They have no idea of walking in the country, nor the least feeling of the lovely scene around them. There are many of them who never saw the falls of Montmorency, though little more than an hour's drive from the town. They seem born without the smallest portion of curiosity, or any idea of the pleasures of the imagination, or indeed any pleasure but that of being admired. Love, or rather coquetry, dress, and devotion, seem to share all their hours. Yet as they are lively, and in general handsome, the men are very ready to excuse their want of knowledge. There are two ladies in the province, I am told, who read— but both of them are above fifty, and they are regarded as prodigies of erudition. 8. In the Evening Absolutely, Lucy, I will marry a savage, and turn squaw, a pretty soft name for an Indian princess. Never was anything so delightful as their lives. They talk of French husbands, but commend me to an Indian one, who lets his wife ramble five hundred miles, without asking where she is going. I was sitting after dinner with a book, in a thicket of hawthorn near the beach, when a loud laugh called my attention to the river, where I saw a canoe of savages making to the shore. There were six women, and two or three children, without one man amongst them. They landed, tied the canoe to the root of a tree, and finding out the most agreeable shady spot amongst the bushes with which the beach was covered, which happened to be very near me, made a fire, on which they laid some fish to broil, and fetching water from the river, sat down on the grass to their frugal repast. I stole softly to the house, and ordering a servant to bring some wine and cold provisions, returned to my squaws. I asked them in French if they were of Lorette. They shook their heads. I repeated the question in English, when the oldest of the women told me they were not, that their country was on the borders of New England, that their husbands, being on a hunting party in the woods, curiosity, and the desire of seeing their brethren, the English who had conquered Quebec, had brought them up the great river, down which they should return as soon as they had seen Montreal. She courteously asked me to sit down and eat with them, which I complied with, and produced my part of the feast. We soon became good company, and brightened the chain of friendship with two bottles of wine, which put them into such spirits that they danced, sung, shook me by the hand, and grew so very fond of me, that I began to be afraid I should not easily get rid of them. They were very unwilling to part with me, but after two or three very ridiculous hours, I, with some difficulty, prevailed on the ladies to pursue their voyage— having first replenished their canoe with provisions, and a few bottles of wine, and given them a letter of recommendation to your brother, that they might be in no distress at Montreal. Adieu, my father has just come in, and has brought some company with him from Quebec to supper. Yours ever, A. Furmore. 
"'Don't you think, my dear, my good sisters the squaws seem to live something the kind of life of our gypsies? The idea struck me as they were dancing. I assure you, there is a good deal of resemblance in their persons. I have seen a fine old seasoned female gypsy, of as dark a complexion as a savage. They are all equally marked as children of the sun.' Letter 17. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street. Repentagne, September 18th, ten at night. I study my fellow traveller closely. His character, indeed, is not difficult to ascertain. His feelings are dull. Nothing makes the least impression on him. He is as insensible to the various beauties of the charming country through which we have travelled as the very Canadian peasants themselves who inhabit it. I watched his eyes at some of the most beautiful prospects, and saw not the least gleam of pleasure there. I introduced him here to an extreme handsome French lady, and as lively as she is handsome the wife of an officer, who is of my acquaintance, the same tasteless composure prevailed. He complained of fatigue, and retired to his apartment at eight. The family are now in bed, and I have an hour to give to my dear Lucy. He admires Emily because he has seen her admired by all of the world, but he cannot taste her charms of himself. They are not of a style to please him. I cannot support the thought of such a woman's being so lost. There are a thousand insensible good young women to be found who would doze away life with him and be happy. A rich, sober, sedate Presbyterian citizen's daughter, educated by her grandmother in the country, who would roll about with him in unwieldy splendor and dream away a lazy existence, would be the proper wife for him. Is it for him, a lifeless composition of earth and water, to unite himself to the active elements which compose my divine Emily. Adieu, my dear. We set out early in the morning for Montreal. Your affectionate, Ed Rivers. Letter 18. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Montreal, September 19th, 11 o'clock. No, my dear, it is impossible she can love him. His dull soul is ill-suited to hers. Heavy, unmeaning, formal, a slave to rules, to ceremony, to etiquette. He is not an idea above those of a gentleman usher. He has been three hours in town without seeing her, dressing, and waiting to pay his compliments first to the general, who is riding and every minute expected back. I am all impatience, though only her friend, but think it would be indecent in me to go without him, and look like a design of reproaching his coldness. How differently are we formed! I should have stole a moment to see the woman I love from the first prince in the universe. The general has returned. Adieu. Till our visit is over, we go from thence to Major Melmoth, whose family I should have told you are in town, and not half a street from us. What a soul of fire has this lover! Tis to profane the word to use it in speaking of him. One o'clock. I am mistaken, Lucy. Astonishing as it is, she loves him. This dull clod of uninformed earth has touched the lively soul of my Emily. Love is indeed the child of caprice. I will not say of sympathy. For what sympathy can there be between two hearts so different? I am hurt. She is lowered in my esteem. I expected to find in the man she loved a mind sensible and tender as her own. I repeat it, my dear Lucy, she loves him. I observed her when we entered the room. She blushed, turned pale, she trembled. Her voice faltered. Every look spoke the strong emotion of her soul. She is paler than when I saw her last. She is, I think, less beautiful, but more touching than ever. There is a languor in her air a softness in her countenance, which are the genuine marks of a heart in love. All the tenderness of her soul is in her eyes. Shall I own to you all my injustice? I hate this man for having the happiness to please her. I cannot even behave to him with the politeness due to every gentleman. I begin to fear my weakness is greater than I supposed. Twenty-second in the evening. I am certainly mad, Lucy. What right have I to expect? You will scarce believe the excess of my folly. I went after dinner to Major Melmoth's. I found Emily at Piquet with Sir George. Can you conceive that I fancied myself ill-used, that I scarce spoke to her, and returned immediately home, though strongly pressed to spend the evening there? I walked two or three times about my room, took my hat, and went to visit the handsomest Frenchwoman at Montreal, whose windows are directly opposite to Major Melmoth's. In the excess of my anger, I asked this lady to dance with me tomorrow at a little ball we are to have out of town. Can you imagine any behaviour more childish? It would have been scarce pardonable at sixteen. Adieu, my letter is called for. I will write to you again in a few days. Yours, Ed Rivers. Major Melmoth tells me they are to be married in a month at Quebec, and to embark immediately for England. I will not be there. I cannot bear to see her devote herself to wretchedness. She will be the most unhappy of her sex with this man. 
I see clearly into his character. His virtue is the mere absence of vice. His good qualities are all of the negative kind. End of letters 13 through 18.